All right, what's going on, guys? Simple Sports back again with another episode. This time reviewing NFL Week One. Yes, I know it's a little bit late, um, but for those of you who don't know, I live in Myrtle Beach, and there is currently a hurricane, hurricane, hovering over our heads, and we've been prepping for that for the last week. So this last week's been a little hectic. Uh, I do apologize, but nonetheless, we are here. We are back. Week one, we're going to go through this. I'm not going to make this super long just because of that reason, um, but I am going to kind of touch on some of the bigger points that I saw over week one. Okay, so first up was a Thursday night game, Eagles and the Falcons. Um, Look, let me start by saying this for all these teams, for all these games. Um, up until about week three, week four, I don't really make any strong swings in my feelings about a team or in my predictions, unless there's just a simple, you know, drastic change. For example, if I had picked the Bills, let's say they go 500 and they come out and they have that performance, sure, I might change it. But by and large, everything that I said before the season, I pretty much am still with, with the exception of a couple of things. But like I said, let's start with the Falcons and the Eagles. First thing is, uh, the Eagles defense is ridiculous, okay? Three goal line stands. Um, I, I don't know how often or how many times that's ever even been done, but three goal line stands in one game, incredible. Um, Nick Foles probably had the most magical Super Bowl run in NFL history because he looked awful all preseason. He looked awful the couple of games leading up to the playoffs. He's looked awful in the first game of the season. Um you know, so hopefully for them, Carson Wentz comes back and he can revert to his standard role as the backup quarterback. Uh, Matt Ryan, as far as I'm concerned, is overrated. I've always said that. Um, I've never been a buyer in him as like an elite quarterback. He's good. Obviously, he's a serviceable guy, but he's not anywhere close to the top five for me. Um, he's in that. If you want to put him in like that second tier, then fine. But that's as far as it goes for me. Um Five incompletions from inside the 10-yard line in the final seconds, that's unacceptable. Um, you know, Matt Ryan, uh, he, he, he missed Julio um, short or behind um, on several throws, uh, including a major one at the end, uh, in the end zone um, early in the fourth quarter. Fourth quarter, geez, I can't talk today. Um, early in the fourth quarter, that resulted in the interception, uh, which, you know, he finished the game 21 for 43, 251, no touchdowns, and a 57 pass rating. I don't get it. They had that game on a silver platter a couple of times with the bad play of Nick Foles that they could have won that game, and I, I just don't get it. Uh, Julio Jones is the best wide receiver in football, in my opinion. Um, no disrespect to Odell. No disrespect to Antonio Brown. No disrespect to any of the top guys. For me, they're all, you're splitting hairs. I'll take the size in that case. Um, and so for me, it's Julio Jones. Um, but he's not getting enough looks in the red zone. That's beating a dead horse uh, across NFL media uh, worldwide. But he's the best receiver in the world. And <laughs> he had 10 catches for 169 and could have done a lot more damage. Um, they had uh, two chances, two really key chances to score his touchdowns. Um, but they went away from Julio and wound up with only three points um, early in the game. Uh, both of those failures and, and the general inability to get Julio the ball, um, it definitely came back to haunt them later in the game. Jason Peters um, is probably the best left tackle in football. Certainly one of them, top three, top five. Um, he, <laughs> it, it was like having a brick wall on wheels that he was just rolling around on the field because he was <laughs> I mean, it's enough said. Um, I, and also, one thing, I gained a little respect for Doug Peterson. Uh, prior to, I didn't really, I mean, I didn't know a whole lot about him. I still don't, quote unquote, know anything about him. But one of the things I did like was he had the guts and, and you know, the team needed a spark. He called the Philly special or, or a variation of, um, again, and, you know, they needed a boost. They were at home. And they just put the statue out and they had the whole Super Bowl thing and they're playing Meek Mills and it was just all perfect. It was all perfectly set up. Um, and so I, I give them props for having the guts to call that go for it on fourth down uh, a couple of times, all that stuff. I, I, I gained a little bit of respect for Doug Peterson for sure. Um, I do have some questions about both teams. Uh, what happens to the Falcons if they have to play a better quarterback? 
Um, maybe it's the Eagles as a whole, but Matt Ryan cannot out- be outperformed by a backup, let alone the other starter on most nights and expect to win. It's just not going to happen. The team is in the defense, especially with the injuries they just suffered, is not good enough. Um, I want to know personally, why do they struggle so much in the red zone? Because, uh, it just doesn't make sense to have a receiver and a quarterback of that ilk. Um, it just, it, it blows my mind. I can't wrap my head around that. Um, Devontae Freeman got a little banged up, so we'll see how that plays out. I know he's out for week two. Um, now I know the Falcons suffered some injuries on defense, specifically Deion Jones. I know that was a huge loss, but I have some questions about the defense in general because a lot of people thought that it was going to be one of the better ones. I don't see that um, because Foles was pretty bad in that game, and the Eagles went 50% on third down still. Um, again, it's week one, so you don't want to get too carried away. But these are the things that I have been looking at. And so what concerns me is these are a lot of these are carryover from last year. And that's why I think they hold more weight than maybe say, you know what, Matt Ryan has had a bad game. That's fine if he does. But these are repeated mistakes. And I think that is the concern that most people have. All right, so let's move on to the Bengals and the Colts. Um, Like I said, I'm going to speed this up a little bit just because I don't want to spend too much time on all of these games. But I have some questions. Listen, everyone's on the Bengals riding high, and that's great and fine, but I'm not going to be fooled by that story again. Um, Andy Dalton threw a pick at the very beginning of the game, and it is exactly – I don't know if it was at the very beginning, um, but it is exactly the reason why I don't trust them to go – pretty much anywhere even if they make the playoffs I think that'll be as far as it goes and the biggest reason for that for me is Andy Dalton um (laughs) and yes I know he is not the worst quarterback in the league yes I know he had a great game against the Ravens at least in the first half um but the first pick that he threw is exactly why I don't believe in the Bengals and it's because they so they're running a screen uh for Mixon and he just lofts it up into nowhere. And it's not as if Mixon wasn't ready for the pass. If that were the case, maybe it's like a deep route. You know, sometimes they just throw a little bit early. That's a different story. This is one where he's getting pressure up the middle. No doubt about it. I'm not questioning that. But it's a screenplay. And all he has to do is flick it out to him. And at one point, he is. The thing is, is Mixon turns right as he's ready to throw it. But he, I don't understand why he just launches it over his head like the enemy look the, like I said the guys in his face it, it it had some effect absolutely but I the ball should have been thrown already at that point I, I is what I, I guess what I'm trying to get at and I don't know why he didn't do it and for me I, I gotta be out on the Bengals um I I don't buy him at all um luck looked okay um I, I'm good with the shoulder at this point I think he looked fine he looked fine throwing it down the field throwing it short still had the same touch and things like that so we'll see how it progresses over the course of the season but the same thing goes for him with that first pick he threw where you know I'm not sure why he made that throw um the linebacker is going to do nothing on that on that scheme but sink into his position about five yards it looks like they're playing cover two it's kind of hard to tell um you know, when you're looking at it on the fly, but it looked like cover two uh, backer is just going to, you know, sink into that hole and, and luck throws it right to him. And I don't know what he's looking at. Uh, again, what do I know? I don't know what the play call was. I don't know what he might have seen, all of that stuff. But from like I said, what it looked like to me was cover two. The backer is going to sink into that curl and he threw it right in his hands. Um, so I don't know. It, but aside from how he looked, um, or as far as how we looked, I think he looked fine. I think he looked, you know, healthy, certainly looked better um, than he did in the preseason. But like I said, in the preseason, I think they were just trying to get him back into football mode. Um, and I think that had a lot to do with the, some of the play calling. So he looks fine. We'll see how it progresses throughout the year. What does concern me about Luck is how he's getting hit and how much he's getting hit. Um, there seems to be no adjustment that has been made either by the coaching staff or or by him to whether it be shorten the field or make the routes quicker. Um, he threw the ball an ungodly amount of times, in my opinion, especially in a loss, uh, in a close game for the most part. Um, 
as much as he needs his line to protect him like any quarterback does, he also needs to protect himself. And, you know, almost three seconds on average from snap to throw uh, with about half of those being, um, you know, knocked down or sacked. And it, three seconds holding the pocket or holding the ball in the pocket, half of the time you're, you're getting hit in some manner, whether it being just a hit or, you know, right after the throw or a sack. You can't have that, especially given his injury history and the, and, and the history of that line and the things that have happened. Uh, he's got to do a little bit better, in my opinion. Uh, but like I said, it's week one. But these are the notes that I that I came across. So. All right. So Bills and Ravens. Nothing really to say there. Um, yeah. Moving on. Bucks and the Saints. So this this for me was the most between this game and the Dolphins Titans game. They're probably the two most misleading games of week one, in my opinion. And it's not to excuse the performance by the Saints defense, not to excuse the performance by Tennessee. Uh, but I don't foresee either of those teams in those games being the norm. Obviously, uh, I, you know, with the weather in Tennessee or in Miami, I guess um, that one was just ugly. It was, you know, seven, eight hour game. That one's just really hard to process. They suffer some injuries, which is terrible. Um but like I said, it, it, it there's you already can't make much out of week one as it is to have that on top of it, it, it. There's really not a whole lot to pull from that game. Like I said, it sucks that they couldn't come out with the win, obviously, especially against the AFC opponent that might be fighting for a wild card spot um, that could come back to bite them later in the year. But um, I'm not going to read into it negatively or positively one way or the other. Same thing with the Bucks and the Saints. Um what I would be concerned about was that they gave up a lot of chunk plays, the Saints did, um, which to me says there were a lot of communication and coaching issues um, and or bad pl bad decisions from the players. Because it's one thing to get kind of dink and dunk down the field. It, a lot of times there's not a lot you can do about that. Sometimes you have to hope for a miscommunication, a bad throw, some good pressure, good coverage. Um, but if they're throwing the ball in two seconds, three, five yards down the field, a lot of times, there's not a lot you can do with that. But the chunk plays, for me, are a concern. Um, that, to me, spells, and especially when it's repeated, 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 over and over and over again, four, five, six chunk plays. And I'm not talking 15, 20 yards. I'm talking 30 and 40 yards. Um, those are the ones that you can't have, uh, especially not multiple times a game. So that's something the Saints got to clean up with. Um, no, I don't buy the bucks one bit. No. Stop. Okay. Alvin Kamara uh, is the real deal, though. Um, I do like him a lot. Um, you see rookie running backs have great years all the time, but I think he's something special. Um, there's something different there. There's a very nice balance between power and, and agility um, and hands as far as catching the ball out of the backfield. It's very difficult to find one that can do all three. Um, Le'Veon Bell can do all three. Um, Zeke can do all three, but he's not great at catching the football. Um, same thing with like Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley is another example. And I don't even think he's an, a great running back in terms of in all three of those areas. He's great at, but I think he's really good, uh, to close to great in all of them. And, you know, a lot of backs don't do that. Derrick Henry doesn't really offer that. He offers power and he offers breakaway speed, but within the box, he's not very agile. He's not very nimble. And so that, that leads to him being tackled a lot for shorter gains. And he might necessarily get with someone else. And so, uh, I really like Kamara. I don't buy the bucks. Uh, I think the saints defense and that, that whole thing was just an anomaly. It was just the epitome of a week one game. Like I said, much like the Titans and the dolphins. All right, so moving on to the Texans and the Patriots. Um, the Pats did what they do, basically. They look clinical. They look sharp, well-coached, you know, uh, the whole nine. Um, nothing really to complain about. The first drive or so looked a little shaky. After that, it was boom, boom, boom down the field, up and down, touchdown, touchdown, turnover, sack. That's why they are favored to go back to the Super Bowl. I didn't see anything from them that I didn't expect. Um, other than the defense looked a lot better um, than I thought they might. Um, Deshaun Watson so far seems to be about where I expected. Um, obviously didn't think he was going to keep up his pace from last year. Um, I think he just had a bad day. 
um, and coupled that with the fact that he only played seven games, people went from one extreme to the other. Um, as far as oh he's great to oh he had a bad game we over, you know we overrated him I think he's somewhere in between I still think he's a competent serviceable quarterback I just don't think he's this uh, you know next top three top five guy I just don't buy that um, but I think he can be in that second tier it's kind of like Cam Newton I think he can have a career similar to or even better than Cam Newton um, but when I think of Cam Newton I don't think of him as a top five quarterback I think of him as somewhere in that second tier along the likes of Matt Ryan, etc. So um Brady still looked like Tom Brady, as sharp as ever at forty one, which is incredible. Um one of the things that did concern me about Watson was he looked pretty comfortable in the pocket. He looked overly comfortable, as if he wasn't aware of the turmoil going on around him. Um, which is great for his personality, um, but it doesn't work for the team. Um, because the line is terrible. And so to have him back there either getting sacked, getting beat up and hurt, or turning the ball over, which he did a couple of times, those are things you can't do. Um, so I don't know. We'll see how he progresses throughout the year as well. Like I said, I thought he would come back to the field a little bit. Um, I think week one, again, like most of these games was kind of an anomaly. But, uh, you know, I think it'll be fine. Um, I don't buy them as like Super Bowl contenders like some people do. Um, certainly not that, but uh, certainly a, a playoff team. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Even a division winner, certainly I can see that. Uh, so I don't want to make it seem like I've you know written them off as a competitive team altogether. But you know, there, there's some missing things there that I think they need to tighten up before we can get to that. Um, one thing I want to mention though with the Pats is, did you know? <laughs> That they are 57 and 2 against the AFC with Tom Brady. I want you to let that sink in, okay? 57 and 2. That is absurd. They've lost twice against the AFC in the regular season. That is absurd, okay? 68 straight games scoring in the second quarter. Um,. And, and it's incredible how 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 deep into the psyche and the strategy the Pats go. Because think about this. You defer the ball at the beginning of the half or the beginning of the game. You get the ball at the start of the second half, uh, which means if you can score at the end of the second quarter and score at the beginning of the third quarter, you could potentially have a 14 point swing in a matter of game minutes, you know, two or three, four or five minutes. Um, and it's incredible because. 68 straight games scoring in the second quarter likely at the very beginning or the very end just because of the way the you know football works um that's incredible 68 straight games uh i don't know that's it's hard to wrap your mind around that that's almost it's four and a half seasons almost um you know coming up this year it'll be five seasons i would expect that to continue um that's that's just an incredible stat. Uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I find that to be absolutely amazing. All right, trucking right along to the Titans and the Dolphins. And like I said before, um, you know, not a whole lot to make out of that game. It was just between the weather and, and it being week one, you know, it, it was hard. I, I will say the things that I did like was uh, Mariota was sharp early um he hit taylor in the end zone on a nice pass taylor dropped it unfortunately um a lot more creative play calling which i do like um mariota did have the pick which i think was a result of the elbow it just it came out weird it, and it was way overthrown the guy he was throwing to was wide i believe it was delaney walker i don't remember off the top of my head but um he was wide open um i think he just i think it, because at, that was his last play and which is why i say that so I wouldn't read too much into it being, you know, such a bad throw. I think that had more to do with the injury than anything else. But um, like I said, I do like the way the offense was running. It was a lot more creative, uh, which is awesome because last year it looked really, really elementary. Um, one thing that really, really, really concerns me is they still have a lot of dumb penalties. Back-to-back uh, -back offsides penalties give away a first down uh, when the Dolphins are on their own one-yard line and they end up going down the field and scoring a touchdown. Uh, you just can't have that. Those are the things that championship teams, winning teams, don't do. You got a team on the one-yard line, um, there's no way that they should go down and score. There's just no way. And they allow that to happen. Um, 
I really like Adoree Jackson, but he I don't know what is up like his coverage. He always seems to be a step late. And the only thing I can think of um as the answer is he's a great athlete. I don't know if he's necessarily a great cornerback. Um he's always seems to be a step late. Um, in the right position a lot of times, but just a little bit late. And for him to be as fast and as quick and shifty as he is, I don't get it. Um, and like I said, I think that is him being more of an athlete than it is him being a corner. I think he has a lot to learn as a cornerback. Um, certainly, it's only his second year, but I've seen some corners come in, like Lattimore and some other guys, Casey Hayward and some other young guys who come in, Denzel Ward, and they have a pretty big impact. And so far... I mean, I, I don't, he hasn't, I don't know if he's had a pick yet. He did force a fumble or two last year. That's for sure. He's pretty good with the return game, but he's not returning anymore. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know. I didn't like the pick necessarily. I like Dory now that he's on the team. I didn't necessarily want that pick when they picked him, but we'll see how he progresses this year. I don't know. It, it, that one concerns me a little bit, but uh, we'll see. All right, so now the 49ers and the Vikings. Uh, another game that was closer than the score might indicate. Um, first thing on the list, the 49ers need a defensive tackle because whoever they got, <laughs> that guy was getting mauled uh, by the Vikings. Um, same thing for the offensive line. There were a couple times where there's offensive linemen just getting pushed in the backfield. Um, now the pick six that he threw is what concerns me. And it's not necessarily that he threw a pick. It's that the throw, while the Vikings fooled him, they, they showed blitz from the left, ended up coming from the right, which is obviously a wily veteran move and a nice coaching move. Um, Garoppolo throws it, and he, it's, it's, it was a panic throw because the blitz came from the left. It looked like he picked everything up properly, shifted this protection and all of that good jazz. And then the blitz comes from the right, and it almost felt like he panicked and just threw it away. Uh, didn't look comfortable. Um, looked like he just kind of froze and threw the ball up for grabs. Um, I'm fine with him throwing it away or something like that, um, but you can't just throw it up for grabs uh, like that. And because what's going to happen is is exactly what did happen, which is the pick six. Um, Physically with him, everything seems to be there. Um, he doesn't have an overly powerful arm like like Cam Newton, but certainly strong enough. Um, it's not the prettiest ball, but typically it's where it needs to be. But the times that it's not, it's way off. <laughs> and a lot of that has to do with his mechanics. He throws off his back foot, um, things like that. Uh, he missed an easy touchdown at about eight minutes or so in the fourth quarter. Uh, for that very reason, I mean, he was wide open and he missed by a mile. Um, uh, he took a sack with about six, six and a half minutes left in the fourth that he didn't need to. Um, had a guy open up the team. Uh, you know, things like that are concerning. But at the same time, this is only his, this is really his first year. Essentially, he's a rookie. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, He's obviously older, and he's had a couple of stars under his belt, but this is his first full year, um, and this is the first time that he's going to be at the head for the year, and teams have more than you know a game or two of footage of him as a backup. So it's going to be interesting to see. I think he's going to do fine eventually. I don't think this year is going to necessarily be super pretty. I think he'll put up you know decent numbers, nothing to necessarily um, to gawk at, but nothing to sneeze at either so moving on to the jags and the giants well first thing they need to do is find a replacement for eric flowers asap because they tried him at left side last year and he got destroyed they tried him at the right side this first week and he got destroyed i don't know what you're going to do with him but <laughs> that's got to stop um they're going to have some trouble running the ball especially specifically between the tackles i think barkley is explosive and gonna gonna have a lot of those 68 yard runs like he did in week one um uh, but them running between the tackles is next to impossible um this is why the jags will not win um you know blake bortles i you gotta love the guy i i don't think he's a very good quarterback but whatever for all intents and purposes personality wise and as far as toughness goes and things like that being able to deal with criticism because i ain't the only one that's called him a bad quarterback 
you got to give him some respect, right? You just have to. Like, for him to, A, not only just still be the quarterback for the Jags, it's, because he has had some really bad games and bad moments, um, but to take all the criticism that he gets from a lot of the media, even some other players and things like that, I have gotten a lot. I've gained a lot more respect as for Blake Boros. I don't think he's a very good quarterback still, um, and I think that's the reason they won't win. Um, case in point: early in the game, they go at Janoris Jenkins with uh, I don't remember the play off the top of my head. It was either a wheel route or just a straight you know go route. Um, but they test Janoris Jenkins down the field. They get the first one, and they come back with an unproven young player running the same elementary play from the same formation. I think it was just flipped to the other side of the field and they run the same route at, at Janoris Jenkins. Now Janoris Jenkins at one point at least was considered one of the better corners in the league. Um, I still think he's up there. Um, but you know, he slipped a little bit last year. Um, and so I think people have kind of forgotten about him, but I, I think he's one of the better corners in the game. You just don't do that. That was like the Richard Sermon, and Packers deal uh, a couple years ago in the playoffs. They had all that chitter chatter going on. And one of the first plays of the game, they throw right at Richard Sermon. Um, because I think a game before that, they didn't throw to him at all. And it was like one of the first or second plays they throw to him and he picks it off. You got to be able to play mentally as much as you do physically. And I don't know if that was, you know, Blake Bortles' decision or the you know the whoever calls the plays their decision maybe it was whoever's decision it was it wasn't a good one uh that's for sure uh as far as the Giants go uh I, I think they'll be fine they struggled offensively but there are a lot of moving parts from last season to this season so like I said week one it is what it is they still almost won the game so I'm not overly concerned um Eli definitely missed a couple of throws but he also made a couple of good ones so i don't know we'll see i still have confidence that they could actually make it to the super bowl i think that offense is explosive which is why i think they will um again they have to work out some kinks in the first couple of weeks but i think they'll be fine going forward all right so probably my favorite game for the whole week one uh was the steelers and the browns and I picked the Browns to win this game actually by a touchdown, um, which I don't know if that was the smartest move, but between all the momentum that they were carrying and all of the noise that we were hearing uh, about the the Steelers and, you know, the Le'Veon Bell situation and James Conner and Big, Big Ben's been talking all summer and uh, so forth and so on. They don't seem to be on the same page. And so I, th I thought for sure that this would be the week the Browns would go in, get a win, and that'll be that. And listen, I, if you were going to tell me before the season there's going to be a team who's going to break a 17-game, 18-game win streak or, what, or a losing streak, whatever the actual number was, one out of the last 32, I know that's for sure. Um, <laughs> uh if you were going to tell me there's a team that's going to break that streak and still not win a game, I certainly would have picked the Browns, and that's exactly what they did. I don't know how. Listen, the Steelers should have won that game a couple of times over, but so should the Browns. And the Browns had, they got six turnovers total, five from Big Ben alone. Um, I'll get to Big Ben in just a second, but. If I'm the Browns and their fans, I'd be really disappointed. I know some of them were. I even know some of the fans, and you could see the passion and, and, and the desire they had for that win. There were people out there in that monsoon just waiting. And it, it seemed like it was there, and they were ready to take it with that field goal in OT. And it was like, finally, finally, the Browns are going to get a win that is, you know, a big-time win. Granted, it is at home. It was a really ugly one, but it was against a divisional opponent in the Steelers in the AFC to start the year. When was the last time the Browns won opening day? And then they blew it. And you know what? Um, it, it was the most brown thing that they could have done. That's for sure. Um, I, Mike Tomlin, I think it's time for a new coach. I think it's time for a new coach. Um, 
you got to have some production. And I know they've been a good team over the last five years or so. Um, but where's the production? What is Super Bowl appearance at least? I mean, come on, man. So towards the end of the game, they had 13 men on the field at one point in crunch time. Like 13 people are on the field. Who? Zero turnovers, um, four, six turnovers by the Cleveland Browns, and you don't win. Uh, there's a lot to be happy about, but but that almost ruined the whole ordeal for me. Um, and much of that had to do with Tyrod Taylor. And I got to tell you, if he's going to play like that again, it is going to be a short leash. Um, some of those throws he made, I'm sure you can blame that on the weather because, like I said, it was a disaster uh, in that regard. But there's no way you don't close that game with six turnovers. Um, I, I I don't get that at all. All right, so moving on to the Cowboys versus the Panthers. Um, this game told me that the Panthers need new coaching, okay? No way, no way am I going to go man-to-man defense versus Cam Newton. No way. Um, and they did it a lot. Um, their offense looked like a college offense. Um, Dak looked lost. I don't know. I've been hearing all the numbers about his passing over the last eight to ten games and how bad it was. And I know I remember how bad he looked, especially in those first three games as Zeke was gone last year. How bad he looked in this game. I I said it last year. I'll say it again. I'm not a Byron Dak Prescott. Never have been. Never will be. I think the one thing that the Dallas Cowboys will regret for a long time is cutting bait with Tony Romo so soon. I'm not saying Tony Romo was some all-time great quarterback, but what you did know with Tony Romo is you were going to be competitive. Those last two years, um, you know, the 14 year, which is the year they had the catch with Des Bryant. The following year, I believe, was the year Romo got hurt, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it was the year after that. Um, regardless, it, Dak Prescott is just not that guy. He's not that good. I don't know what everyone else is seeing. Maybe it's because he's a nice guy. He plays for the Cowboys. He's a quarterback. He's a black quarterback. Um, he says all the right things to some people. I don't get it. I do not get it. Um, I think he's a fine quarterback. He's a bottom third quarterback. Um, but I think he'll do. And that's not necessarily to say he's a bad quarterback because a lot of the court, I mean, th there are a lot of good quarterbacks. And so you have to go down a big, long list in order to get to Dak Prescott. And that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying he's a terrible quarterback, but he's just not that guy. And for this team to be as, uh, to, for this team to lack as much talent as they do in a lot of places, specifically on the offensive side of the ball, uh, and some on the defense, uh, you got to have better quarterback play if you're going to expect to be competitive because the rest of your team isn't that good. Uh, I think if they had a better team, I think that could take them to a Super Bowl. But no receivers to throw to. Zeke gained some weight over the summer, heading into the season anyway. A um, couple injuries on the offensive line. They definitely need Earl Thomas big time. <laughs> Earl Thomas wins in that football game. There was a throw made of, as like third down and one, third and two. Uh, with about 11 t uh, minutes left in the first half. Uh, and Earl Thomas would have made that the pick six. Uh, it, it was a terrible throw. The safety that played it played it awfully. Well, he read it well, but he just didn't make a play on the ball. Earl Thomas would have taken that thing to the house. Uh, there was also a screen that Earl Thomas would have blown up. Um, same thing. And, you know, uh, it, it was a missed tackle, ended up in the field goal, and, and, you know, that goes on, but they could have kept them from scoring before the half. And, you know, who knows what that looks like, uh, what that game goes like at, at that point. Um, Sean Lee looked lost out there. He can't tackle. Uh, I know there's at least four or five that I counted, maybe more. Uh, something is up up there. Uh, I don't know what it is, but he did not look like Sean Lee. Um, Cam Newton holds on to the ball entirely too long. He misses throws that come open early, and I know that's been said a couple of times. I just happened to see it this time. Uh, I never really studied that before, but, yeah, I, I watched for that. And, yeah, he holds on to the ball quite a lot um, and a lot longer than he probably should. And Dak Prescott did the same thing on the on the fourth down where he missed that throw out of bounds. It was, it was high. 
Uh, he has a perfect drop. He has a perfect hitch. He takes one step forward too many, and it forces his throw high because of the pressure uh, with that extra half a second. Uh, it looked like Thompson ran a good route, and he was definitely open. Um, Dak missed him. Uh, he could have caught the ball that was thrown. It looked like it's hard to tell watching it on TV, but it looked like it hit his hands and whatnot. Uh, so he definitely could have caught it still, but Dak missed him for sure. I got a question about Jason Garrett. Uh, I think this is it for him. Uh, I got a lot of questions about the Dallas coaching in general, uh, but I think this is it for Jason Garrett. Um, it there needs to be a a, a rehaul or re, a makeover, something with Dallas because Jason Garrett's been there for a long time. They haven't won anything. Um, some of that coaching staff's been there for a minute. They haven't won anything. Dak Prescott, we're going into year three. We'll see how that goes. Offensive line has been together for a couple of years. They were the quote unquote best line in football for the last two to three years. They haven't done anything. Des Bryant's gone. Jason Witten's gone. Sean Lee is there, but he can't tackle, and we don't know if he could, if he could stay healthy. So we'll see. I don't. I didn't pick them to make the playoffs. I thought they were going to have a pretty miserable year. Uh, I'm not saying they're going to go like two and fourteen or three and thirteen, but I can certainly see six and ten, seven and nine on their horizon. That is for sure. Sure. All right, and I'll just blow through the last of these really quickly um, because I didn't watch all of these games in their entirety, so I don't want to go into too much detail with the remainder. Um, I did get a chance to watch the uh, Bears and the Packers. Khalil Mack is a beast. Aaron Rodgers, we'll see how that plays out with the injury. I, I judge Aaron Rodgers now like I used to judge Peyton Manning. I don't care what he does in the regular season. I really don't. When he gets to the playoffs, can we see some results, okay? It's been, what, six years, seven years since the Super Bowl? However long it's been? Eight years? I don't know. Ten years? One, two playoff victories since then? I don't know how many they got. I don't know all the numbers off the top of my head. But what I do know is they haven't sniffed the Super Bowl, um, except for the year with the... Seahawks that one game where they had to come back um aside from that I don't know the last time they were even close uh, I know they were in the, the what you call it, the other year but Atlanta smoked them it wasn't even a contest so I don't know I, I like I said I'm not paying attention to Aaron Rodgers until he gets to the playoffs once he gets to the playoffs then we can talk about him cool all right good deal uh I did the Seahawks and the Broncos not a whole lot going on there. I don't buy either one of those teams for much of anything, so we'll just skip that for now. Uh, I do like Russell Wilson a lot, but, I mean, he's running for his life back there. <laughs> so, uh, Redskins and Cardinals, shout out to AP. I actually had a question on one of the older episodes, over under 500 yards for AP. I may have to retract that because he might, he might actually go for 1,000 at the pace he's going, but I don't know. It's... Listen, he wants to break Emmitt's record and more power to him. I hope he does, but it's just not feasible. I don't know how he's going to do that. He's going to need four or five more 1,000-plus yard seasons in order to do that, and that's just – I don't see that in his body. It's different for a running back versus a quarterback. I know Brady's 41. He's obviously a lot younger, uh, especially in football years, but the running backs take a whole different beating than quarterbacks do. And he is not the type to necessarily avoid contact either. So uh, he might have some problems reaching that goal. Uh, Jets versus Lion. I was really impressed by Sam Darnold. Um, not so much with the Lions. Um, I was impressed by Darnold. I was really impressed by Bowles, Todd Bowles and the coaching staff for putting Darnold in the position to succeed. And I was then impressed by Darnold taking advantage of that coaching and those opportunities to get this team a big, big, big win. Um, so shout out to Sam Darnold. Uh, we'll see how he turns out over the course of this year. I I'm not quite ready to go to them going to the playoffs or anything like that yet. But like I said, I'll have another amendment to some of my predictions within the next two to three weeks as we start to see these teams sort of develop an identity, discover an identity, get some things ironed out and, and show us who they really are. I, you know, listen, week one, even week two, unless you go 0-2, um, could be 
as big of a misleading thing in the NFL as anything else. And so you don't want to read too much into it. Um, and last but not least, were the Rams and the Raiders, uh, the last Monday night game. Uh, well, clearly, for personnel-wise, trading Khalil Mack was a mistake. Um, you can't say we need a pass rusher after you just traded the best pass rusher or one of the best pass rushers in football away. Uh, you just can't do that. Derek Carr, I Skip Bayless said something on FS1 that I've been saying for quite a while. I don't think the Raiders, and the, or at least John Gruden, Certainly. I don't think the Raiders are that sold on Derek Carr. I think Derek Carr is a serviceable guy, but he I'm trying to find his comp, and I just can't quite place it because I think physically he's got everything. I just think it's just not, I don't know, there's something missing. Maybe like an Alex Smith where, sure, of course, he can make all of the plays. He can even run a little bit. He's very nimble in the pocket. He can throw the ball down the field. He can throw it short. He can make cover or make uh, audibles that are necessary. But it's like it just every now and then it, there's kind of a head scratching moment, and or it's like that's as far as we can go with Alex Smith. I think they're kind of in the same boat with Derek Carr. I think Derek Carr is a good quarterback. I think he can make all the throws. I don't know how far he can take the Raiders, especially not as their constructor right now because he's not elevating them. Uh, I definitely he's definitely not that guy. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the year, they decided to just cut bait with him. to be honest, trade him, cut him, whatever the, the case may be, uh, get some draft picks along with the picks you got for Khalil Mack and really start this thing over as they head to Vegas. I think that's what we're headed for. Uh, so I'm not going to read too much in the week one. They were competitive with the Rams, which I wasn't necessarily expecting. I actually thought this was going to be a blowout. They're a lot more competitive at least in the beginning than I thought they might be, but uh, it, it didn't pan out that way in the end. So, All right, and that should about do it for us for this episode. I know this probably went a lot longer than you expected, even I expected, because I said this was going to be short. I tried to go through each game. I realized I was going a little bit long on some of them. Um, but next time, we'll, we'll shorten it up a little bit. Uh, and it won't be into week three before I do the video on week two this time because the storm should be and I know it hasn't rained for a while so the storm should be pretty much over I think we're getting towards the end of it so all goes well in that regard I will see you guys in the next episode take care peace